that will that never, never work. work. You, can't you can't publish, publish that. that. Seriously? No, 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 Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to Episode 7 of Horrible Writing. This is Paul Sadane, your host of this fabulously titled podcast that scares away all my writer friends. Because they think I'm trying to pick on them. I'm not. <laughs> How are you doing? I hope this finds you well. It is uh, July. According to my calendar still, July 2017. So I hope your summer is going well. Of course, this is the depressing time of year for me because I've realized we passed uh, the summer solstice and days are getting shorter. And when you live in Washington State and you need to survive November through March, uh, you really cling to the beauty that is April through October. And I don't want it to end. I'm having a whole lot of fun having sun and, you know, mid 70s to low 80s degree temperatures all the time. Yeah. Hate me if you will. It's beautiful here. I love this place. Anyways, I hope this finds you well. I want to talk about uh, something near and dear to me personal revelation. This show claims. To be candid, it claims to be raw. You're going to get it. It's going to be mushy. You don't like it. Don't listen. It's okay. I know men talking about mush makes people uncomfortable, some people. So if that's you, hey, there's always episode eight. <laughs> uh, so uh, as far as word count update, still editing. Why am I still editing? Because I'm actually recording this episode the same day I recorded episode six. So nothing's changed. Sorry. Task and time management, folks. I cannot stop every single week and record a podcast episode. Why? Those of you who've listened to the first six episodes know the answer. There will be a quiz in three, two, one. That's right, because I'm protecting my writing time. So I have it scheduled every two weeks to sit down and record two or three episodes of this show. They're only released weekly. I shouldn't say only. That's enough as that's aggressive enough as it is for a podcaster. Uh, But yeah, so I'm sometimes recording almost a month ahead of time. I say this to be honest with you. There's no smoke and mirrors with me. I don't have time or the inclination for that. I'm going to be straight up before I get laid up. I don't even know if that makes sense. I have no idea what that means. (laughs) So... Uh, it, it, so here it is, uh, you know, raw, open and honest. I have changed nothing in my word count because I took a five minute break between episode six, got some more coffee. My heart's skipping a little bit. Sarah Werner of the right now podcast always worries that my heart will explode. And I'm getting straight into episode seven because today is my horrible writing podcast day, not day. It's my two hour block where I work on as much of this as I can. And that's it. What gets done gets done. And that's it, because I still have a job to do, and the rest of the time of my schedule is protected family time, brain dead time, and of course, the writing time. So let's just be real. That's how I do it. You know, I'm approaching, I can't do the quick calculation because I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me, but I'm approaching a hundred and, well, 194,000 words this year. So I'm okay with being honest with you all, and I think you all will appreciate it. You're right. You don't want anybody blowing smoke. You want real talk about this stuff. So I hope that helps because some days I don't think I should be doing this. And when I say this, I mean all of this. This podcast, my four other podcasts, (laughs) three, one of them still in development. So I'm not going to try to be hyperbolic in this episode. Uh, so, you know, them, 
uh, the two books I'm working on editing, the third book that I'm starting to outline, I have writer and audio dramatist all over my social media presence. My thanks to my website host. If you Google the website or Google my name, the website comes up as author Paul Sadin, which isn't true. I mean, technically I've published stuff and I have made money on it, so I guess I am, but I don't feel it. I don't even feel it that I'm a writer. I don't feel I've earned that because I'm trying to navigate my way through this channel of choppy, shark-infested water, and it just doesn't feel legitimate. I don't think, anyways. So, one of the things that I try to do on a recurring basis, periodic, but recurring, is schedule decompression time for myself. Since it is summer in the Pacific Northwest, one of the ways that I do decompress is by camping. I absolutely, I hated it as a kid. I love it as an adult. It sucks getting ready to go. It sucks getting there and setting up the camp when you've worked all day and you need to get everything set up before the sun sets. But otherwise, uh, from that time until the time you tear down everything, it's exquisite. It's beautiful. If you've never camped and you're a writer, I don't want to put anybody in, in, in harm's way. So be safe. Learn some stuff first. But I challenge you to start small and try it. Maybe rent some equipment, borrow it from a friend, and try camping. As a creative, especially as a writer, being able to get to a campsite away and out here, in the Pacific Northwest, there are some wonderful campsites uh, where you don't even see the other campers. You get away from people, you get away from the noise and the distractions and all those things I've begged you to protect your writing from, and you get to be with you and the people you love maybe, or you just want to be around, and you get to be in your thoughts. Like for me, I get up early because you can't really sleep in when you camp. And, you know, I assume that traditional male role and start the fire because that's my role. And I'm being sarcastic for any of you who don't know me. And I sit, man, I love getting up on a nice, chilly summer morning, getting that fire going, you know, getting. Okay, we're glampers. We do bring a a little camping oven and propane with us so we can have coffee (laughs) and getting that cup of coffee. I'll tell you what, camping coffee, mm, good stuff. <laughs> it makes you feel like a caveman again, returns me to my roots. And to either read or to write, I write when I camp. I, I bring a cheap little laptop with me that uses RTF files, and I write because I'm in my space. But the th- neat thing about that is I don't have the noise of everything else, especially where we go. It's hard, even if you have a very prominent cell phone provider like we do it's hard to get a signal so you're really unattached you're detached from the world and i love it i absolutely love it because there's no temptation and i can really just get lost i don't write for any other purpose when i'm camping than to write i don't know what it is in my brain i don't know why but when i'm sitting here in this office and i'm working on who killed julie I can see my other computer monitor. I can see my cell phone. I know my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed are inches away, seconds away, because I got awesome internet here. And it changes my perspective a little bit. I don't write for people. I can't. I don't want to. I've never been able to. I don't think I ever will be able to. I may. You'll you, If you listen to this show for a long term, you may two years from now, hear that I'm the newest uh, romance writer, erotic writer, erotica, (laughs) erotic writer, I'm an erotic writer, erotica writer under some pen name, right? But for right now, and that's not a slam on anybody who writes romance or erotica, uh, that's that's fine. Uh, And it's a very plausible business model. Uh, That's where you're going to make your money if you want to be a self-published writer, unfortunately or fortunately. It's just not my thing. I'm into high fantasy and horror so 
erotica and romance don't appeal to me as a reader. Uh, but anyway, it's totally off tangent here. So as I'm writing Who Killed Julie, for example, because that's my most recent project, besides editing uh, the story for The Lift that I've got coming up, and besides editing a couple other short stories that I've got for my own patrons, I it's weird. I have this filter where the commercial aspect isn't too far away. Not that I'm writing to be commercially successful, but that, that feel that, that aspect isn't too far away or it's, it's there. It's hanging out in the corner of the room, eating out of the potato chip bowl while everyone else is in the other room, you know, playing a card game, but it's there when I write, or I'm sorry, when I camp, it's just me and those characters. And, and that's why I love it. That's why as soon as we can in our personal lives, my wife and I have talked, we're going to downsize it, it immediately. The first chance we get, we're downsizing this house and we're downsizing our lives. And we're going to find a place where we can live close enough to her job. I, I work from home, get to her job, but where we can get away. I want to get away from people. I want to get away from the noise and be able to get in touch with that creative part of myself. Fortunately for me, she still agrees with that. She wants that as well. So I'm really lucky. But the writing or the, the camping time really cleanses my writing palette. It gives me that mental space to breathe. And because my laptop does not last forever and there is no way to recharge it except to go into town back around civilization back around people then and it so it dies on me it takes me away from being able to write i'm not able to write especially when we go over long weekends that kills me it hurts to not be able to fire up that laptop and start writing but because i want to reframe it to be encouraging and positive for you, the positive outcome of that is the fact that when I can, whether it's one or two days of not writing, I am yearning to get back to that keyboard. I become that 16-year-old boy who hasn't seen his girlfriend in two days and cannot wait to smell her again, to hold her hand, to kiss her. I cannot wait to intimately embrace my writing again. How's that for awkward for some of you? <laughs> Am I poking at your uh, comfort zone? <laughs> but that's what it's really like for me. Writing is that intimate. It really means that much to me. And I miss it when it's gone. Now, juxtapose that with what I'm going through as we speak this morning. The last four mornings, I believe, I've been editing this damn story that I'm writing for another podcast. I love this story. This story is bigger than what their structure allows. This is not a slam on them. I love them. It is an audio drama that I will recommend day in and day out because the concept is so clever in the, st in the stories, though written by a team of like 20 different people, not all at the same episode individually, uh, they flow, they work, and it's just a really clever project. I love it. And they've got their way they need to do business, and I appreciate that. For me as a writer, and especially for this story, uh, it's hard. Season two, I wrote a story for The Lift called The Box. You can find over at uh, victoriaslift.com. Um, I wrote that, and it wasn't that hard. I went through a couple edits, four, five, six, sent it to them. Went through two more rounds of editing, and we were good to go. With this story, I haven't even sent it to them yet. And again, like I said earlier, uh, it's 7,400 words at its inception. Their max word count was about 3,500 for me. Yeah, twice as much as what they needed, plus. And I actually had to reach out to John Grills. Well, he volunteered. I, I just reached out to the writing community. Going back to episode six, where I talked about there are benefits to being in a community. I went to the I Am A Writer Facebook page, 
from Sarah Werner of the Right Now podcast. And I said, I hate editing. Despise it. Can't stand it. Um, any tips, tools, and tactics for overwriting? Because I'm struggling with the overwriting. Anyways, we had a good conversation. And John volunteered. Uh, he, John Grills of the Small Town Horror podcast, smalltownhorror.com, and a self-published author of four books, I believe. So check him out. Uh, I will put the links in the show notes. Offered to take a look at it. And within three or four hours, here I've been struggling for four days to cut this word count down, and I got it down to about 5,500. So I cut 2,000 words out of a 7,400-word story. I got it down to about that and then sent it off to him. And within three hours-ish, he emailed me back with a 3,500-word count version of it he said I, I i feel it doesn't take away from the story and it kept the spirit of what you were going for and i tried to get rid of the stuff that i felt as a reader the story could still survive with missing and i think that was critical for him to help me be able to see that because i couldn't anymore i couldn't see where i could so i'll tell you what i did i'm not going to take all of his suggestions and john is a wonderful guy and as a writer it's our creation and we owe it to our creation to protect it, not that he was trying to harm it, but we ultimately decide creativity, creatively, creatively, wow, creatively, where we want to go with that story. And I'm incorporating a lot of what he suggested into this now fifth version of this story. So I haven't, so, so, Unplugging during camping makes me miss it. Unplugging when I'm here in civilization, when I could be writing, kills me. It jades me. I get frustrated. I mean, I do. I really get, I, I told my wife while I was pouring my coffee this morning and she was pouring hers that I'm not going to get anything accomplished today. And she's like, what are you talking about? You've been in your office for an hour. What have you been doing? <laughs> well, I wasn't doing anything dirty. I promise. I was editing, but for me, editing something that I've already created feels to me like I'm not getting anything done. That may sound strange to some of you, and that's okay. We're all different, but for me, that's what it feels like. In a perfect world, I would have the money and the cognitive connection with an editor where I could just ver verbally vomit into a Scrivener project. I could compile that thing, send it over to them, and they would make it do what it needs to do. And I could go start a new project. Perfect world. That's what I would do. Can't do it. It's not reasonable or feasible. So this is where I'm at. But it's two different worlds. So that's why that unplugging that I do while I'm camping is so crucial to my momentum. What are you doing for your momentum? What do you do for your creativity that re-energizes it. It doesn't have to be a four-day camping trip, but what is it that you're doing? Could you answer me if, if I was standing here looking at you face-to-face -face over a cup of coffee, because coffee and beer, uh, nectar of the gods right there, if we were sitting down doing one of those two things, and if you're opposed to beer and coffee, um, I could go out for soda or ice cream. Ice cream. We'll do ice cream. That's safe. <laughs> But if we were sitting down together and I asked you just out of the blue, what do you do to, to re-energize your creativity? Could you answer me instantly? If not, I'm going to challenge you in this episode to get me that answer before episode eight. Do it. What are you doing that re-energizes you, that mental space that you have to live in, that where your creativity lives, where you reach into that chasm and you grasp it and say, and you pull it back into the world and you say, okay, let's go hand in hand. Let's go create. And when, you know, when I wrote or when I was camping, I did write, like I said, I wrote almost 5,000 words of who killed Julie. And, um, because of the temperatures and whatnot, the laptop, and because it's cheap, the laptop died, uh, that evening. So I didn't get to go back to day number two, but it's not a bad day, right? Of camping while you're camping. Uh, to, pu to punch out 5,000 words. And that helped. And the reason I say this is because that helped me. I had to get over owning my writing. 
the desire to write, and that hang-up about being called a writer. Because like I said it in the beginning, I felt guilty about that. Like I was wasting my time. I could be doing other things. There are house projects, to-do lists that it just seem to get longer every day. I could be doing those. I could be playing video games. I got Witcher 3 that I have not finished yet, and it needs to be conquered because I love that game. No, they are not a sponsor. I just love that game. And I could be walking the dogs. I could be, you know, walking around the neighborhood, running, exercising more. I could be just going and sitting at the city park and people watching. I could be, you know, taking two-step lessons with my wife. There's all kinds of things I could be doing. But the guilt that I felt, I realized, was because I couldn't want to not write. I wanted to do it all the time. I wanted to sacrifice everything so that I could write more. Now, this is coming from somebody who doesn't feel legit. And and hear what I just said. I couldn't want to not want to write. I couldn't. I wanted to sacrifice everything to write more. That's what I realized. And that's where the guilt came in because you have to have a balance with everything in life. Can't be giving up family time all the time. Sometimes, yes. But if you have your protected writing time, that needs to stay your protected writing time. You have to protect the time for your family, your loved ones. You have to protect other healthy time. You have to unplug from writing sometimes. That's what I do when I play video games. I'm just going brain dead. I don't want to think about anything. I don't want to think about the sucky world and the horrible people in it who just do nothing but harm each other. I don't want to think about politics. I don't want to think about religion and social issues. I don't want to think about my characters thinking about those things. I just want to not think. And I have those times. And they're very healthy for me because when I come back, I come back like a bull. Same thing with the camping. So when I recognized this about myself, I said, I need to do an episode because I'm now feeling guilty that I can't not want to write. And now I want to sacrifice more. Knock it off, Paul. You're not there yet. Slow your roll, son. You know, I'm having this self dialogue with myself, but I still don't feel it. I still don't like it when people call me a writer, when people assert that I am a writer, I've got hundreds of thousands of downloads of my podcast. Not this one. This one's way too new for people to be finding yet, but please help it be find, found. Tell your other writer friends, please, if you like what I do, if it helps you, please. Um, but hundreds of thousands of downloads of my other podcasts. I've got tens of short stories out there for my patrons and newsletter uh, su- subscribers, which you can sign up for at paulsighting.com, by the way. Um, so my stuff is out there, but at the same time, I don't feel it. I still don't feel like I've earned it. And I don't like it personally when it's asserted that I know people are just trying to encourage. And that's what I'm trying to do with this show, this entire series. But at the same time, that's something that's my issue to deal with, right? I have to work on that, but that's where I'm at. And these things help you know, doing this analysis helps. But it doesn't stop me. I don't allow it to stop me. And I hope the newness of what you're doing won't stop you from doing, doing. Okay. I want, I want to hit on that conversation from episode six where I told you about the the 1090 construct. 10% of your time goes to community, 90% of your time goes to your craft. I believe that's a fair balance if you're serious about this. Again, for any of you hobbyists, you may not agree, and that's okay. That message goes to those of you who really, really want this. So, I want to hearken back to that conversation in episode six about the unhealthy conversations in that audio drama group that I was talking about. One of the problems that I had with it, because people can't focus on the argument they actually construct, they want to start deviating from it. 
They want to avoid confrontation, so they add or they straw man. You know, they they try to build an argument for the argument that's not being presented. The uh, the guy's comments were unhealthy, and I did not appreciate those being on my thread because he again he was just detr- de- degrading and detracting from everyone's creations except his, which. I, I listened to his show and I wasn't impressed. And he's a person who really needs to spend 90% of his time on his craft and not in the community being toxic. The reason, the core reason why I did not like what he did was because I prefer to take a macro perspective of everything. And I know that annoys people who know me personally because I try to consider a million options, a million factors, a million aspects of everything that people say. Because there is no right and wrong in the world. Sorry, folks. It's just Paul's opinion. Ding, ding, ding. Another segment of Paul's opinion. There is no right and wrong. People do the things they do because they believe they're right. Not because they're sitting. Hollywood has got us convinced that the villain sits there and goes, I'm going to be evil. No, that's not reality. The villains in life think they're doing the right thing. This guy, the a jackass though he was, thought he was doing the right thing. He was saying that we need to be more critical. He was blinded by that, not seeing the damage he was doing by the way he was communicating it. While I'm sitting there observing this conversation from afar, growing increasingly more frustrated, because he's he's not going to impact me. I blew him off within the first paragraph of his first post. Never mind the subsequent 14 more he went on about how bad everybody else sucks except him. I don't care about people like that. They don't have no influence on me whatsoever. He has done nothing in his li- life to impress me to the point where I think I need to listen to him. But because I take a macro perspective on life, I realized unlike him, a man in his 40s or 50s, by according to his picture, who should know better, I realized he was condemning the writing of, he said, 95% of audio drama. So, you know, nine and a half out of 10 of us in that 1,200-person group, that's a lot of friggin' people, right? What's 95% of 1,200? So let me do the quick math for me because I don't want to try it. It's over 1,000 of the members. What, what I realized was he was damning and condemning people who haven't been where we've been. I'm in my 40s, like I said in last episode. He's definitely in his 40s, if not older. Seriously, he's older, though. But the people who are watching that conversation and his comments and hundreds of people flooding into this or hundreds of comments flooding into this uh, was the fact that there are people who haven't walked where we've walked yet. The things that I've done in my life, the 20 years of serving in the military, the things I did in the military, the life experience that I have since being a military person, now being out in the civilian community, owning a number of homes, raising a family, the trauma of life after 40 years, you learn. It makes you a more comprehensive person, not more well-rounded, but you just have more experience to draw from. Now, when I was in my 20s, I thought I did then too. That's, And, and I'm sure a 60-year-old listen to, listening to me is thinking, <laughs> 40s, you got a lot to learn. I agree. Those 20-year-olds, those 25-year-olds in that group, there are people in that group who have a lot of potential. Some of them are college kids, and I, and I don't mean to be derogatory, okay? You're young in my eyes. So I don't mean that in any derogatory measure. I'm more of a, uh, an affectionate me- uh, verbiage. But there are people in, in college, in their tw- early 20s in that group, who he slandered, in my opinion, and damaged, potentially damaged them. I can't say he did because I don't know where they're at. I, I saw some claims that help verify what I believe. But I believe he he damaged people. This is hard. If you're a writer, you already know this, that this is hard. This ain't easy. And 
to to be told or to have someone say make claims like that, a lot of us will internalize that. We'll do that reflection time in the mirror and wonder if he was talking about us. And you're already on the precipice. You're already on the edge about not being competent. In episode six, you heard Dohai's letter where he talked about rewriting that sample made him feel more confident. We, as creatives, struggle with confidence because, by the nature of what we do. The last thing we need is destructive influences to, to potentially damage that. And we don't need, who needs that? We don't need it, so we don't need to be around it. I say all of this to encourage those of you who are struggling with the confidence or who are very new to this, again, I consider myself new to it. I don't consider myself worthy of the title of writer, even though I have earned money from my writing. And I don't. And that's my demon to deal with. You have your own. But I use that example again, not to regurgitate toxicity, but to encourage you that you're new to this, so what? We're all new to something in our lives. The 70 year old that's, you know, discovered podcast a few weeks ago who tripped across this one and is listening right now. That person is still new to something unless they've completely given up the desire to live and explore life. None of us are experts at everything in life. And I realize that's very extreme language really concrete terms I used. I, I use those deliberately. No one is an expert at everything. We're all new to something. Caveat, if we want to grow, if we want to explore life. So you're new to this. Protect yourself, please. Protect yourself in a way that's that works for you. Like me and my Recurring camping trips where I write, I get away, I kill the noise, and then I come back missing my mistress that is writing. That works for me. This time around, I just happen to have that epiphany about why I felt that guilt. And it went deeper than I thought it was going to. I'm not even asking you to do that exploration. I'm asking you to do something healthy for yourself. And what is it? If I were to ask you tomorrow, you'd be able to answer me right away, right? Because you're thinking about that now. And then recognize that you're new to this. You are going to screw up. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to make, you're going to write shitty stuff. You're going to write horrible stuff. And that's okay because that's how you're going to get better. Surround yourself with healthy people. You are the sum of the total of the five people, five closest people to you, the five people you spend the most time with. So if you're on those Facebook groups full of toxic whiners, guess what? It's going to rub off. Get away from it. Join Sarah's group. I am a writer on Facebook. It's a beautiful exchange. Join Susan's group for love or money. Tell both of them that I sent you, please. But be around healthy people, positive people, encouraging people. They're not going. They're not going to give you platitudes. I'm not going to send you anywhere where people are going to give you platitudes. I promise. Platitudes are a waste of your time. But so is toxicity. They're just going to be real, and they're going to be positive and encouraging. And isn't that a beautiful thing? Don't we all need that? Ooh, the bad, horrible music is back again. That must mean it's time for some horrible writing. This time, Rajmary Perez Pardo, and if I mispronounced your name, Rajmary, I totally, totally, completely apologize. Um, She submitted from the I Am A Writer Facebook group, shared something that she wrote and has up on her Wattpad uh, website, which I will provide for you in the show links. But if you're jotting it down now, it's wattpad.com, and you look for Rajmary Perez P., And she's got a couple stories out there. She wrote this piece, and I'll tell you why after I've read it. So here's Raj Mary's piece. 
I feel tired every day for the past week. I've been feeling more and more exhausted. The mental and spiritual effort is sometimes almost too great to bear. I try to be strong for my parents, and I try not to be overly aggressive with my brother. I try to crumble once everybody has fallen asleep. Every morning and every night, I just think about one thing. One more. One more day. Just one more. I stay up till past midnight, and even when I sleep eight hours, sometimes even more, I wake up tired. I ask for protection and strength all the time, and protection for my parents and my brother. Each night when they say goodnight, I ask for protection for them so this is not their last day alive. My family cannot afford to lose one of them. As for me, I only ask to hang on a little more. I feel just like a guy that was fighting back tear gas bombs. I'm not afraid of dying because life here is crap anyway. When you live in hell for so long, you just get way over the fear of death. It doesn't mean you want her to come any sooner because your family would never survive it especially in circumstances like this, but you just don't lose your sleep before the possibility to meet her. Every day, every night, it's the same phrase, the same prayer. One more. Just one more day. Just give my family another day. And then I'll be off. So she wrote it, when she was living in a place where she didn't want to live. But what she was able to share with me was the positive impact that it helped a friend of hers who read it truly understand how it felt for her to live where she lived. She does say that it made him worry a little more. Uh, about her, which uh, from from that passage, you can understand why. But what we do as creatives, what we do as writers, is we convey these stories. We convey understanding. We convey messages. We convey a bond. When people listen to our audio dramas, when they read what we write, that's what we're doing. You hear the adage a lot about, you know, show, don't tell. And as someone who doesn't feel worthy of the title writer myself, I know I'm guilty of telling more than I'm showing, and I constantly try to improve. I'm going to talk about why in a future episode, but I've had an epiphany lately as to why I'm doing that. It's apropos to what she contributed here, though. And in, in, in my feelings about what she, Raj Mary contributed. We, when we do these things, when we extend this part of ourselves, we're doing more than just telling stories. The, the people on the other end who are reading or listening to these things are filling in the blanks that we le- leave for them with their own perspective and their own interpretation of the world. Sometimes it gets reactions that are powerful, like this. You know, the it helped him understand what she was going through, but at the same time, because he's obviously a, a good person who cares, it made him worry more because that was very raw. And Roger Mary, thank you very much for sharing such an intimate passage in this episode because it was it was very raw, and I. I know I, I said I said this last episode too. It's not easy for us to put this stuff out there for the world to hear and see. So people who do earn mad respect from me because it's not easy. It's hard to do. And especially something as intimate as this piece was. It's important when we do these things because of that. 
she conveyed a bond. She conveyed meaning. She conveyed perspective. She helped someone else understand, someone not in her position understand. Think about that. These are just black characters on a white background in, the, in a digital format. I mean, she may have printed this out on paper. I don't know. But, I mean, these are just binary codes of zeros and ones that somehow, because I'm not that smart, appear as letters that we can interpret and understand. And look at what the impact of what it did. Even on that scale, one to one, that's powerful stuff. It's a beautiful responsibility that we have. Thank you, Raj Mary, one more time for submitting that. And again, all of you, any one of you, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your horrible writing, but give me that positive impact. Give me that positive point, that takeaway from it, the difference it made. You're starting to hear more and more samples now. Thank you very much to everyone who is contributing. Um, and, but I would like a lot more. I would like to struggle to survive or to, to choose to select which one I'm going to use in episodes. So hit me up at horrible writing podcast at Gmail. Go over to paulsating.com. Use the contact tab. Sign up for the newsletter there while you're there. Why not? I don't spam anyone. I don't believe in that. I respect you and your time way too much for that. Hit me up on uh, Instagram or Twitter at Paul Sading, or you can reach the show on Twitter. Follow the show, retweet it, please help help other writers find it at Writing Horrible. Also, wherever you get this, if you could leave a review and a five star rating, that would be greatly appreciated, so other writers can find it. It's been a very rewarding two episodes. I was very honest with you at the beginning. I'll be very honest with you at the end. <laughs> I don't plan on recording for at least another week, maybe longer, because I need to get this story done for the lift. I need to get my August story done for my patrons. They deserve that effort. I want to make it the best I can make it. So I need to dedicate the flexible time that I have, because I still have my writing time each day, but that flex time that I deliberately schedule into each day has been used today for this podcast, but for at least the next week, it won't be because those things, those, those priorities protect my writing time, protect your writing time. And in that spirit, I've talked for way too long. I hope this show is helping others. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're around for the long ride and we can all celebrate our publishing accomplishments together. If you've got them, send them. I want to give you some shout outs. All right. Until next time, it's Paul Sading saying, be epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sading, your host, extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse, at Writing Horrible, and over at paulsading.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. <laughs> <laughs>